Yeah. It, um, it gets to slow down a wee bit now because um, we've got a time uh, where you get to share it a little bit on your own and um, Patrick's kindly volunteered, been volunteered to, to share that. Just a little commercial break before we do that. Andy found his copy of the Design of Everyday Things. Um, so you're welcome to have a flick through that inside if, if, you, if you want to buy it. It's just a fun book. It's got, well, on the, on the cover it's what they call the Masochist's Teapot. Um, and, uh, and it just goes down from there really. It's actually the book's from 1988, um, but so, so there's no high technology here, but it's just, it gets, it's a great one to get you thinking about bad design and so on. There's plenty of other things to get you thinking about bad design and so on. Well, that's just a part of some thoughts there. One other thing I'll just mention while I remember about the videos um, before, the other ones on your clip drive. Now, the computer science um, type of videos there almost exclusively have been designed for teachers to look at, not for students. Um, so, someone quite rightly made the comment that we had the, um, the boys struggling with the really bad algorithm with the, the sorting and then the, the girl um, did the really clever algorithm and all that sort of stuff and was there a subliminal message there. Um, actually, so those are not, I mean you could show them to a class if you really wanted to, but um, it's much more fun for your class to do things. You know, you don't want to say, oh here's a video of some kids having fun, so we enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I hope that's kind of obvious. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and, and the way that most, the Unplugged project itself um, has been going for about 20 years, most of the material in that uh, has, is, is that old, um, but uh, Google sponsored it because the very first CS for HS was run at Carnegie Mellon University in 2006, uh, where they had this great idea to do exactly what we're doing here these two days, and they said to Google, just give us a big pile of money and we'll, we'll sort it out, and Google said, oh yeah, give it a go, and it was so successful. And this year it finally comes back come to New Zealand, um, which is actually, and, and, but Unplugged was used at the very first one, and it was actually one of the things they got the most feedback on, and positive feedback, and so it's always been a part of it. So when we got it here, um, they, they said, oh, by the way, you should probably consider using Unplugged as part of what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Canterbury, of course, is the home of Unplugged, so that's really nice. Um, so th those videos are from the Unplugged project. Um, most of them, what we found is that here's a cool thing to do, and, and they just look at it and go, oh, it doesn't make sense. And so someone said, oh, you should make a video of some kids doing it. And we literally, most of this was filmed at Chisnall Intermediate. Yeah, Chisnall Intermediate. <laughs> I've got um, good inroads to the teaching staff there. So that's, um, what we do is I just go along in the morning and, and say to one of my wife's friends, uh, the colleagues there, um, can you spare a couple of kids for an hour to go on a video and sign a form saying we can put it on the web? And they just send some random kids over and do the activity. So nearly all those videos are just kids who, you know, got together, we've said, look, just do this, and the kids go, okay, and they do it. Um, so when, um, and, and so it's, it's really is just a demonstration of what it would be like if you kids doing it. It's definitely not, you know, a staged thing to show people, you know, to, to show the kids that. There are a couple of them that are specifically designed to show the kids, but they'll be obvious, and, and I'll talk about some of those tomorrow. Um, they've, they've got puzzles and things in them. In fact, one of them you can win a prize if you decode a hidden message. Which uh, one person in the world has done so far, so there's a challenge. Um, now, where are we up to? Can I just have 30 seconds? Yes. I meant to finish up with this. Um, one of the people who worked with Sandy and I, Karen Gray, is well enough. She's been a tutor with us for eight years. She's a qualified English teacher, trained and qualified English teacher, been working with us for eight years. Uh, she has made herself available over the summer to travel the country and to give workshops, two day workshops on these standards and on programming. Uh, if a group of schools want to get together and bring her out, um, she needs travel and accommodation, obviously, and I think $250 per day. But if a group of schools get together uh, and want to have one of our people come to them, uh, Karen Gray is great, and grab one of these handouts at some point, and I'll actually have them come and work with you for two days. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put my email up, just contact me. Well, one of the things that's been really cool is that there are um, seven uh, universities in New Zealand that have a department called computer science, or something very similar to that. Our one's called computer science and software engineering. 
Um, and all seven are working together uh, to try and deliver material for teachers. And so, particularly Otago, Victoria, Canterbury have been uh, quite active, but every, every other university has done a nominee who's active at some level to try and help out local teachers and so on. Uh, and all of the heads of those departments have chipped in funds um, so that we can collectively do things. So a lot of the resources and material that you see has been funded by the universities because um, we're all pretty excited that this is happening. Um, so some of it's free, some of it's thanks to industry sponsorship, some of it um, at very nominal fees and, and it's just it's great to see some colleagues from around uh, the country sort of stepping up for that. Uh, but in the end, um, you are the people who know what works in the school and so this next session, Pat Patrick, if you'd like to take over, this is by teachers, for teachers, um, I thought it would be really interesting because a lot of you already have taught some of these standards so far. Um, we've already heard a few ideas and stories and things like that. Patrick, I know, has taken the bull by the horns and done a, done a whole lot with that. So um, if none of you have anything to share, I'm sure Patrick will have something that you can share. Uh, but yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. And so you have to earn your afternoon tea with a, a bit of sharing and uh, yeah, peer support. Yes, so I'm really just <coughs> facilitating a discussion on the things that worked and didn't work with uh, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46 standards. Um, this year being the first year that, that it, was, um, it was offered, I thought, I've only been teaching for nine years, but right, right been computing all the way, but right from the word go I've thought that actually we haven't So really what I want to do is, um, in the 15 minutes I've got, is just to get some ideas from you folk about what worked and what didn't work. And, and I'm quite happy to start with myself. 1.44, for example, the, the concepts of computer science. My idea was to, uh, to teach that as a research-based um, write a report, giving them a structured sort of thing to follow. I quickly found out um, <coughs> within a, a week of starting it that the kids just weren't up to that kind of theory, they didn't understand it, that what I needed to do was to give them some practical examples and the, the uh, unplugged videos gave me a start, some things to try. I, I, I bought off trade me a set of um, scales for 20 bucks. If they're balanced scales, they look a bit more like scales of justice, so some sort of would be antique thing. And I bought, also I've trade me some of those canisters, film canisters, I got about 150 for 10 bucks or something, so way more than I needed. So I've got some spare if anybody wants any. And, and, uh, so, and, 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 and as soon as the kids were actually doing something, I also bought um, packs of cards, and for, I think for 20 bucks, I got 20 packs of, packs of cards. And, and I was able to work through with them picking out some random cards and then going through some of the sorting algorithms that we used. We looked at the, um, uh, the, those websites that we talked about before with the examples on them. I got them first of all to go through and to, to write down in their own words what was actually happening on the, on the algorithm, look at what's happening, how it's taking the biggest one and what it's doing. And then I got them to use the, the sets of cards draw their own random sets and in pairs, they work together and, um, and I, what I found was as soon as we got off the straight, trying to teach them straight theory, 
got, got them into actually using practical examples, they got it. They got it. They didn't all get it, but they got it at a lot higher rate than they were getting it when I was trying to explain it to them and, and just give them the straight theory. So that was the thing I learned about 1.44, I think. Yeah, and the, the, the HCI, again, that was another thing where regurgitating the theory just by looking at those um, heuristic concepts was didn't demonstrate any understanding, whereas when they got each other's cell phone, swapped cell phones, and were able to write about why theirs was better than the other and actually relate that to interacting with the device, then they were able to demonstrate that understanding that they needed. So anyway, that's enough for me. I was supposed to be asking you guys, so what worked for you guys for 1.44? What was someone who taught 1.44? What, what, what went well? Didn't go well. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think with the HCI, I find it's quite important to uh, write uh, at least one exemplar of what I thought Jim should be talking about. Because up until that point, um, I, I, they really struggled to kind of express themselves. But once I gave them a bit of a language and a structure, um, they find it a lot more straightforward to talk about the kind of so what did you work through an example with them? And I just did one. I looked at some different, I forget exactly what I looked at. Might be media players, might be... I looked at cameras. Right, cameras. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or by um, uh, alphabetical order first to last name, and you use the, use the distribution of work and how efficient it is when we're in alphabetical order versus type order. It's kind of fun, it gets the point across, and it's overall, I, I guess it's just a way of demonstrating the point. Yeah. It seems to work. <laughs> What about the uh, natural language as opposed to programming language as opposed to algorithm, algorithm algorithmic language? How did people cope with that? I mean, our kids. Yes. I wasn't really sure because I went mean, to a conference and there uh, was a big discussion about uh, what algorithms to use, whether you use flowcharts or. Um, Pseudo code or nasty Schneider diagrams, which I've never heard of before. Um, so I thought I thought them flowcharts and pseudo code, and then, but I think when it came to writing the report, they, you know, I focused quite a lot on that in the beginning because I thought that would be the most important thing. Something 
which is understandable in human terms, the algorithm is breaking it down <coughs> into a halfway point between what a machine will understand and what a human can understand. Um, and then, of course, when we get to the putting it into code, it's so that the machine can understand it. And although these high le level languages are easy enough for us to understand if we understand the language, um, I think that's the whole point. Natural language, algorithmic expression, programming language. Do you think, have I got it right there, do you think, Bill? Yeah, I just had an idea that it's not mine, I don't claim for it, but a possibility of way of doing that is, is to have a whole series of informal instructions, algorithm instructions, program instructions, mix them all up, give them to the kids and say, now tell me what this is, and they have to tell you why they have made those choices, because then maybe they're starting to think about, hey, why did I say this is an algorithm as opposed to this one being a program? I don't know, it's a possibility, I'm just yeah. thinking about this other way to do it. Is this in the, in the external, is it? That you have to be able to tell the difference between the 1.44 here. No, that was that was a secret idea. And the idea in, in, in one point four four was can you explain the difference between things being um, in informal instructions versus algorithm versus a program? So you were meant to be able to show sort of a, an increasing rigor in terms of how things were expressed. Yeah, but, and so, uh, there was another way that, that we tried as well, which was to taking the inverse and getting um, I got it and I got this idea from the web. The, 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 the task was to draw a traffic light. And so I picked a, a student at random and he was allowed to give instructions to the class um, about the picture without actually saying what it was. So he had to say, draw a rectangle, draw a circle, towards the top of the rectangle, another circle in the middle, and, then, and so we had 26 different versions of the traffic light. I think there was one, one guy, that, or one girl, I think, that actually worked it out. But just to show that actually plain language can't be precise enough to, to do some things. Um, yeah, just a, a practical task you can do. Um, based on like logo, which are simple commands, and it's, uh, it's sequential. So you could have it have, say, here's a list of commands on the board, you can only use these, and you know, uh, try and direct somebody around the table or whatever. Um, and they quite enjoy that, you know, take one step forward. And then, and then you can get it, then you can get into discussions about, okay, well, how big is the step, you know, in terms of distance and all words. Yes. Moving on then to the assemblers, compilers, and high-level and low-level languages, which is the next part of the, the, the external, I'm wondering the last part, I can't remember now, but how did, how did you get that across? I, find, I found it very difficult to do that part, except just in theoretical terms, but I know there are better ways of doing it. So, I mean, the, the, well, I can understand it. I think, and I'm looking at the new standard, which is uh, this one, this is the same, so it's one four four. Um, <coughs> we talked this morning about determining the cost of an algorithm, so I'll put that there again. But um, uh, <coughs> comparing and contrasting high level and low level machine languages and explaining the different ways in which programs in a high level programming language are translated into machine language. Anybody have any innovative ideas of how to put that across? Mine's more a confession really. I got myself tied into knots completely because I was trying to, my kids have been programming in Python. Um, and we looked at um, Visual Basic and talked about how you had to compile Visual Basic. 
and so that, and that you had to go back into the source code to recompile it if you wanted to change it. And I lost everybody, including myself. I got myself confused. Um, so I don't really know how to do it well. And I'd really love to hear how people actually effectively did it. And using a practical thing like that though, you're, you're on the right track I think, because I tried to do it just theoretically because I didn't have any better tools available to me. Just saying, let's look on the internet, find out what a compiler does, what, what's a compiled language, what's an interpreted language, and just look at the differences and we were just doing it theoretically. Whereas I think when, when, you, when you try and apply it to something, they learn it and understand it a lot better even if maybe you won't get as confused this year. Yeah. The way we did it when we were actual students learning stuff like low level and high level languages is we went right back to machine codes and like those logo instructions that you've got, instead of just telling them load, you give them like an instruction with zeros and ones, and this means load, this means read, this means write, and you get them to, to, to write out instructions for something simple like write down the number two and make them go through writing down the steps and then from there they go to more like a logo code. Logo code is very close to machine code. Because if you look at the way you program a logo language versus how you program a Python language, it gives you a better comparison of what a low level language looks like compared to a, a high level language. Mm. Yeah. Did anybody teach too? Did anyone teach a compiled and interpreted language? Just to Cement that vision. I actually got my kids. Um, I mean, I taught Scratch, and then um, I come back. I come from a background of Pascal, and I thought, all right, you don't have to know how to program in Pascal. Here is a program, but these are the steps you have to go through. And what I liked was that you actually have to compile before it runs, so they see this message compiling. Da 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 da. And I showed them that if you made a syntax mistake that would not come past. I, I don't know if they really got the whole idea, I hope they did, um, to the effect that if you make a mistake before it will run, it's got to compile the whole thing and find the error messages as to one object code. And I could show them, look, there's the Pascal, and there's the source code, and there's the object code for the thing. And then because we've been doing Scratch, it was a case of shaking them, well, how did we get a Scratch program to end? And it just clicked the green flag, and if there was a mistake, it stopped. Mm -hmm. And that was trying to get them out of an interpreter, which only does it in line at the time. So that's yeah. basically how I did it. And they had to give me some examples as to what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Good. In Python 2, you can have, for instance, um, and because it's interpreted, an error that will only come up at the time you reach the line with the error on it. So if you've got you know, something which is wrong, but the program never goes through that line, it can do other things quite happily. Mm -hmm. so so Whereas if it, was, if it was Pascal, and you tried to compile it, it would stop at that stage and say, well, sorry, I can't compile this because it doesn't make any sense. So you know, the compiled language compiles the whole thing before you start. The interpreter is every time you run a line, it does the compile of that individual line. Mm -hmm. But if you never actually use the line, you may never even see the error message. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those of us teaching, oh, sorry. So, um, I haven't thought that standard, but it sounds, um, if I was going to do that, I would use it with a, um, an embedded system. And something as simple as a pickaxe, uh, by choosing a different architecture, it means that you have to change, uh, use a different compiler. So if you can find it for an accurate address, you can have the same piece of code, but the code that gets generated for the, the output code that gets generated will be different depending on which architecture you use. So the kids, quite often with the um, tickets, they'd say, oh, I've compiled, but when I sent my code to the chip, it didn't do anything. And that's because the code that they sent to the chip was for a different architecture, so they actually have to go into the settings and choose to target the device, so right. then they would understand that they have to be in the file specifically for that architecture. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you, uh, I was going to mention that if you were working in something like NetBeans, there's a problem in that you're half interpreted and half compiled mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that right. yeah. can make it a bit awkward, so I kind of step away from that when we came to that. 
the thunder. We actually did one point four rates, so we were using the pickaxe. The problem is that the pickaxe doesn't actually compile either. <laughs> it actually takes the code. Now this is quite a neat thing to show the kids because the codes are very large and it puts it in the type of pseudocode which is much smaller and therefore for the memory. And it's actually interpreted within the pickaxe, a little interpreter sitting there. However, there are some pickaxes which you have an option you can go to it and say compile instead. So at least they started to know the differences and the reason, one of the reasons for compiling. Okay. And that sort of alluded to a problem, but is that we're actually dealing with shades of grey in an area where we're trying to teach some black and white concepts. You know, we're trying to say, you know, compiler and machine code, but we've got all sorts of halfway houses in between. Yes. Um, and it does become quite complicated. Um, it's sort of like trying to teach a word processor versus a desktop publisher, mm -hmm. but now Word has got so many desktop publishing features in it that it's sort of hard to say that this word process is not actually... Can you sort of, it's sort of everything? Yeah. The, the boundaries start to blur yeah. quite enormously in it. Is it quite tricky to, to choose clear-cut examples of... Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the main thing is for that 1.44 is that um, that they must demonstrate understanding. And demonstrate understanding means more than just copying out and more than just writing down an answer. They've actually got to have done some things. So they're not probably going to get it all right. And, and for most of us, I've got a, a, a systems analysis background, so actually programming stuff's new to me this year as well. Um, um, but you know we're not going to. You know it's hard enough for, for us to, to get our heads around it. I think the main thing is that as the kids work through the exercises that we give them, there's got to be evidence that they can produce that demonstrates their understanding to whatever level they're going to make. So 2.44. There were two more standards that we were going to do, but I think we'll flag it. Well, no, we won't necessarily flag it, but. Um, the important things are on the schedule, which is afternoon tea. Sure. Um, so, so we'll do that. But um, the, the next hour or so after afternoon tea was really intended as a kind of what would you like to do session anyway. Um, this, this is said sounds really interesting. So if you want to just carry on with some of this after afternoon tea anyway, or and then we can still do a breakout groups thing after that. Yeah, it's so like complicated in terms of content. So yeah, probably not it's one now. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. So, um, so let's take 20 minutes for afternoon tea. Back here at 24. And uh, we'll pay a lot of food So, um, so 1.44, in, in a nutshell, we've, we've kind of covered the ground, I think, between what um, we talked about this morning um, and things that have come out over the course of the day, as well as what we covered in that last half hour before we broke for coffee. But 1.45, the old algorithmic, create an algorithmic structure or something, now called construct a plan for a basic computer program for a specified task. Um, there are differences in the way that it's going to be uh, delivered next year, but, but uh, not that great a difference really in that it was called an algorithm in 2011. It's called a plan for, uh, for programming task in 2012. Um, but the, the way I uh, delivered this one is I worked through, um, because it was algorithmic structures, I worked through algorithms starting with the cup of tea and catching a bus and making a piece of toast. And then uh, right through to um, over a period of three or four weeks, through to uh, uh, more complex uh, algorithms, um, including the uh, iteration, sequential structures, etc. And um, and then we. The mistake that I made was trying to do it separately from the programming, and that's what I'll definitely do differently next time, is when I came back to try and do it in scratch, because I was doing it for the first time and I was learning it as well, 
um, it seemed logical to me to, to start with the algorithm and cover that completely before we start doing the programming, but I was wrong for those reasons that we talked about before, we actually talked about earlier. Uh, but actually they go hand in hand together and, and so um, what I'll definitely be doing this coming year is talk about an algorithm, maybe start with, or sorry, basic plan, talk about going to the bus stop and maybe a cup of, a cup of tea or whatever, <clears throat> and then moving on to um, uh, maybe calculating wages or something like that that involves a little bit of calculation and input. And then, and then immediately going to Scratch and taking the algorithm that we've just developed, going to Scratch and putting it into Scratch. So that as we go, the, the, the learning scaffolding up. And um, what I, the way I built them up to the, to, the, um, to the programming task was that we developed algorithms all the way up to include what I thought was required for the assessment. And then I gave them a completely different problem when it came to, and then we went, started at the beginning again as well. I mean, to scratch simple programs up to more complex ones. And then, and then I gave them an algorithm, um, which was to uh, paper, scissors, rock, and said they could use this one, which I knew was right, or they could use their own if I approved it, because I needed to see that the algorithm they were going to use um, was, was going to be correct. Actually, the algorithms they'd written were done, the assessment was done in a two-hour exam. So I, I used it as our exam. September, it was. And um, uh, yes, they were allowed to use that algorithm if I thought it was going to, if I thought it was programmable. Um, so anyway, that, that, it, it's as far as teaching Scratch goes, there was plenty of resources out there. It was it was quite it was an easy thing to teach. The algorithm thing, well, that was you know, there were resources out there as well for that. But, but, that um, uh, tell you to break up problems into the, into the various areas. And <coughs> so, yeah, apart from merging them together, which is the main thing that I'll do, and I, I have to rewrite all the material now for this too, to make sure that they line up with these standards, which I really haven't studied uh, too much. But um, so, how did, how did other people approach? Yeah. Um, it was rather good. Um, the Canterbury region got together and through Vilna, um, she basically helped set the scene for it by providing a um, sort of a task that could be both algorithmic as well as programming, uh, which, which um, but she made the point of saying that you could do them separately or you could do them together. Yeah, but yeah, you teach them together. Yeah, so um, for our students, they actually found that really good. They found doing the planning and the what, what your inputs, what your outputs, what your test started, and your algorithm all together so that plan that is now being asked for was is where, where our students were, all, were starting to get towards. They went through, created their program, and if they struck any problems about it, they wrote about it. Uh, whether it be in comments or whether it be with screenshots going, why didn't this part work? Yeah. So it gave the students an, um, a sort of an understanding about what is going to come with level two. Yes. So um, the part that I like that was we want our students to be language what is it? Independent. Language independent. Language agnostic. Yeah. <laughs> because if we start focusing on just one language, the students aren't going to get anything out of the courses that we offer. Yeah. To get, to give them whether it be Scratch one year, Python one year, and then another language the third year. Um, someone was talking about on the way to dinner yesterday that they, did, they do small basic, then they do visual basic, then they do visu um, C sharp, which has a nice flow on structure with them. So I guess around the algorithm stuff, um, the students actually, once they got used to what language text you write it in, that was the hardest part, is just getting them to put it into a natural language rather than um, start using the, 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 the symbols. Because um, they still struggle with greater than or less than. Um, I think students will always struggle with that, but it gives it gave them a nice understanding about what what what's ahead. So, yeah. so a crucial thing there was 
point Jeff made there was actually recording the process and because to, to, to be able to um, demonstrate um, programming skills to an excellent standard, they need to be able to show the development and show screenshots is probably the best way of doing it. What was wrong with it? What, what, at what point was this program? Did it get to this stage? What was wrong with it? What changes did they make? Another screenshot for the next day. What did they do here? Well, that was how we covered it anyway. So lots of screenshots showing the development of the program. And of course, yes, yeah, sorry. So I'll probably just explain what I mean by that is that um, I'm talking about problem analysis. In other words, they have to break down the problem once and put it on some test data, how they're going to do version 1, version 2, version 3, etc. And when they do the coding, I'm a believer in you get the first bit working to version one, test it, yep, that's fine. Now you have on the next bit, get that working, test it, and go on. So in other words, it's this iterative process of the time. And yes, I teach the planning and the coding at the same time. So you can go through um, in the scratch, I did it back to different to what you did, Patrick. I taught them some scratch first. In other words, how to get input, how to get output, what are the etc. Then we did some problem analysis that only had that. Then we went on to conditional techniques in Scratch. And then we did problems that based on that. And then we went on to loops, techniques in Scratch, problems based on that. So it's almost a case of that it is iterative. But what I found um, is that if they've got their plan, they have to think it out. They have to think first what they're going to do, what goes in, what comes out, yeah. how am I going to get from here to here. When they start doing their coding and they find that they've got errors, um, to follow what Gerard was saying, that um, they never really went back to the plan, they actually fixed it up in the code. Yeah. So they were changing the plan, if you like, in the code, which follows on a bit of what Anton was saying, is that you modify as you go along. They never went back to the algorithm plan. It's just not in the student's thinking. They've thought it out first, now they're coding and they find, oh hang on, I didn't quite think that right. They didn't really always go back to that. So that's why I actually this year assessed them two differently. I talked together, but I gave them an assessment where they just didn't give me the plan, and then, excuse me, then I gave them another task where they had to give me the code. So they totally had to do the test, totally separate tasks. Um, so, they had the plan, I gave them the plan in the second one, and then they had to do the coding and testing. So I was really looking at, can they do the coding and testing? Now in the second one, I did not give them the test data. They had to work out their test data for the coding side. That was part of what they had to do, and that's when you call your expected boundary, whatever, and plus. But they have to document what they're doing. That to me was how, I could get authenticity that they were actually doing it and they weren't saying, oh, so and so is working on that. And because, yeah. you know, they're doing it over four lessons in class, you know, maybe they're talking to you outside, mm -hmm. that's okay. But they need to show they've actually done it themselves. That, that's how I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, next, so, for this, with the, the new standards, Donna, um, because we kind of need to look at them together, it'll fit more with what the way you were doing it anyway. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I call yeah. them what I would think are what I call fundamental principles, yeah. which is your sequential selection and iteration. Now they go to the fourth one, which is procedures, yeah. which is what they're going to go into. So I will keep, I'm not going to switch to Python from level two, because, well, I'm sort of onto the soapbox already. Um, they're going to have to learn syntax now. I have to cope with that. So hopefully, I don't know, we'll see, hopefully they have got the constructs that I've put this year, and all they're doing is they're translating it into a new <coughs> language, which is what we're saying the program is. It's just a different language, and they will do that. And then we'll go on to the techniques of modules, procedures, parameters. Um, parameter pricing is not an easy concept to tell you now, because even my year 13 has struggled with it's been brought down into level two. Originally, we only left it to level three, but it's been brought down to level two. So it is quite an advanced concept, but we'll just see how we go. But I will. I'll teach some techniques first, and then we'll do problem analysis together. How are we going to see that? I think that's I do um, 
Pearl at Year 10 from a Moodle, um, and then I repeat exactly the same thing again at Year 11, but they take it further, so the Year 10 stop at a certain part and do an assessment and then they move on to the next bit. And I've done that for a number of years now, so I feel I've been really good at teaching how to program and how to write code, and the, the letdown for me was the um, algorithms and the testing. So my kids can write code and the code works well and it's all gone really well but then where I then had to go back and look at my assessments and look at my teaching, next year I'm going to have to bring that in much earlier and, and more implicitly teach it as well. So I've just taught the programming for the last three or four years and now I have to go back and add the explicit testing and the algorithm stuff to it. Um, but I'm planning on doing that right from the beginning, so I'm thinking about a Hello World um, code will be structured diagrams and then a testing case and then the program and then an explanation and then an example of the testing so that they see it right from the beginning because by the time I drop back into the structured diagrams they've got the programming but they don't get the syntax or the, the understanding of the structured diagrams. Um, you, you've actually done the hard bit. So really what you, all you're doing is, because they must be doing some testing and planning without even realising it. All you've got to do is formalise that. And so, you know, if, you've, if they've got the concept of programming, you've actually got the hard bit. It's just formalising what they must that, be doing. It's the hard bit and it's the easy bit. It's the bit the kids enjoy doing. Mate. It's the bit that they'll sit there and work on until they get it right and then they'll jump up and go, woo woo woo, I got it! But they don't do that about a testing plan. <laughs> so I mean, I've got the easy, I've got the easy bit as far as motivation goes. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Algorithm for programming. In terms of the um, having a plan, writing the code, and then modifying the code, which implies they should have modified the plan. It's hard for students to know when they're still trying to get their code to work and match the plan, and when they've changed from the plan to something else in, in what they changed. You know, fixing their code that didn't work so that it matches the plan, or fixing their code so that it works and realising the plan didn't say that at all. It's hard for them to see the difference. So it's more getting the students to actually think about the problem. So it, all the steps in the plan might not be exactly the same. The students might change, well, I found some students did change their work partway through, but what they're doing is they're going through and going, right, these are the variables that I need, these are where they need to be set. Here's my input, here's my processing, here's my output. What needs to happen in my processing to basically make sure that, okay, here's these five inputs, what are the outputs that are going to come out? As long as the inputs and outputs are right, we're, we're calculating correctly whatever happened in that process part, whether it, whether it not be correct, whether they use an if statement instead of a for loop, or whether they use a repeat or something like that, they're learning along the way. And that was the part that I was more intrigued at, was how are they learning and having those one-to-one -one conversations with them around, why did you do this? when you could have done this. Sorry, so yours was a draft which they could modify. Yeah, so they had their input up, which their testing tables and then their draft album. Then when they're doing their practical work, what is that? But they did go back and change their algorithm as well as their code. So Okay. 
it's not a teaching strategy, but it's a, it's a funny story from teaching programming. We did a code where they had the, the computer said, what is your name? And they type in the name and then it says, oh, hello Max, nice to meet you. And, and how old are you? And you type in your age and depending on the age of people you're teaching, and either, you know, if you, you, for the kids they always want to be told that they're older. So the kids as well, you look so much older than that. And, and I had the bell go, and the kids all rushed out, and the new class came in, the, 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 academically challenged kids came in there. And one of the kids sat down at the computer and it was a window there and it's, they left themselves locked in and it said, what is your name? And he said, oh, whoa, look at this. And all the guys came over and they asking me for my name. What should I do? And they type in the name. So, Jimmy, I am Now it's talking back and said, hello, Jimmy, how are you? <laughs> Standing that more and that's a lot more next year. Do some work. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a typing, I have heard of to pull the keyboard across and you type in your keyboard to the screen on the other side. You know, hello, how are we? You know, the computer is, etc. Yeah. Anybody got anything else you'd like to share about 1.45? I think we're done. Well, just oh, yeah. Sorry, in terms of practical stuff, who, who did uh, Rocks as a Paper as their sort of um, choice of what the kids should actually produce for the assessment? <coughs> Not many. Can I just get some ideas oh. of what other people chose as their assessment um, task? As the sort of... Uh, moon lander. Moon lander. Mm -hmm. but in terms of um, pro sorry, complexity, isn't the moon lander one a little bit tough? I mean, I did that with Tim uh, last year. Uh, sorry, earlier this year. Um, and I found it, and we discussed it, and we thought it was probably a bit too tough for the one with all the maths. What's the paper? Because it, what didn't involve so much maths just seemed a bit more accessible. And uh, out of all the kids that attempted it, almost everyone achieved. For the papers as well? Yeah. Just a more accessible algorithm. Yes. In, you know, yes. I did a really very simple task in a three hour system. So for me it was purely a case of counting male or female animals going through a race. So it was a farmer counting animals going through a race and I just got the natural hand and then at the end it gave them the total. Asked them what to do again. So my priority was a tally. Who does not use um, Scratch? Who did something other than Scratch? So, and, and did anyone who did use Scratch? About half and half, right? Did anyone do Alice? Is that hard? No. We did that. We did Alice as our kids, just like we were doing so we just did a simple child's game, similar to yours. The brief was that I had to be numerous literacy base. I was just simple, click on five, can you find five rabbits? Just one of the characters who said, well done, John, can you find all five rabbits? But they like the animation, they like the rabbits popping up, disappearing. I don't think at level one it doesn't have to be a very complex task, as long as they can cover the essential elements to get excellence, which they can do on a on an easier task, but it doesn't need to be a point. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm just thinking that old version, you had to have nested loops and you had to have complex conditional things, and all that stuff's disappeared, so it's, it's yeah. it looks like it'll be easier. Yeah. Is, it actually, is it worth going through that new standard? <coughs> Would be. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say that the moon then thing was just over the head for lots of kids. The idea of you know gravity is a number that goes down and plus is a number that goes up and negative numbers and positive numbers. That really was quite hard for them to you know get two negatives make a positive type cons you know just it's really difficult for the level one. And oh yeah and multiplying by ten is quite hard for some of my kids. With the simple task.
they can show their, their excellence by the extras that they put into it. It might be that um, with paper, scissors and rock, they've got, they've got graphical elements that come on and they can, they can use their creativity a yeah. little bit. And um, you, you can do different things. I, I don't think the task has to be too complicated, although... How do other people see the new one in terms of the setup is really more skillful and efficient? So we no longer have to have the, the loops and the iterations, etc. Yeah, no, we're just going to just talk about that. It might be a good idea if we went through those new standards. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, does someone want to talk about that? There's a, I mean, there's a couple of people here who looked at them a lot more closely than me. The, the, the change in the level one standards. Yeah, Anthony. Yeah. Have we got a copy of the new version? Yes, yeah, they're on the thing. They're in the back. The, the, the two one. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, 91075 and 91076. The head at the start of my talk that had all the standards, the programming standards. Yeah, got level two at the front and then level one. Yeah, but where's the one for the conversion? There is no new. 45 to 46 for the only ones that changed. Okay, so the history of this is is quite complicated. But the writers of the original versions of these standards had a lot of constraints set on them by the ministry and they did the best they could within them. Uh, basically, in my opinion, these standards should have been knowledge standards and we should have been looking at progressions in depth of knowledge. Instead, they're the, the practically oriented standards which are about skillfully and efficiently, sort of the technology oriented step ups of skillfully and efficiently. And they didn't really, to my mind, quite get their heads around how to address that in the standards. So they tried to look for increases of complexity in what the student was doing as an indication of skillfully and efficiently. So they introduced the idea of, of I think, nested iteration. Was that what was required mm. for excellence? Yeah. The problem was that that changes the task. A task either has nested iteration in it or it doesn't. And to retrofit it into a task that doesn't have it is just plain wrong. Uh, and it's not efficient, it's the opposite of efficient. So when it came time to redraft these things, we were looking for a different way to progress these ideas of, of skillfully and efficiently. So we talked about all different ways that we might measure those kinds of things, and we got to the kinds of indicators uh, that are in the, in the standards now. Now I talked about the level two standards where it's about how well organised is the code and the testing and the commenting and so on. Those are all the step-ups that are involved in the current draft of Level 1. Level 2 was also about modular design, which isn't in Level 1. And it was about um, right. scope and passing the right parameters and so on, which is part of modular design. So that's not in Level 1 either. But Level 1 tries to get the same kinds of ideas. Are you commenting and testing well? Those kinds of step-ups. And then is the procedural design uh, the organisation of your loops and ifs and so on. Is your procedural design just barely working? Is it working and doing nothing obviously wrong, well chosen? Or is it uh, this, this nicely structured logical decomposition? Is it a good design that addresses the task economically and efficiently? So that's the kind of progression in skillfully uh, and efficiently that we, we tried to converge on, uh, getting away from the idea that those things could be measured by putting specific markers in, like nested for loops, which fit some tasks and don't fit others, and then that you had to, in effect, have a different task at excellence level. And we were told over and over again that we couldn't do that. That had to be the same task performed in different ways. Uh, so that's that's the history of the How long can we keep using the old level for? What's the life of the old vision? Because as a picture with so many new changes, I obviously want to pace the changes I'm forced to implement. Gosh, I've got no idea that. Yeah. That's I'm out of it. But Dr. Norrie this morning said you can still use the old version next year. Yeah. Yeah.
the, the, the old versions of 144 and yeah. uh, 45 and 46. I haven't seen anything. No. No. I'm sure something I read somewhere this morning. I haven't posted it. I worry for someone. The other thing is that if you didn't update your um, versions to make what the new achievement standards are, you'd get wrecked over the knuckles from um, the moderation. Okay. So I would say that it would be the same. You can say that you can go on versions that between our achievement centers and the previous thing you can get in trouble. No, they're not really in trouble. Oh, sorry, that's about time. Exploring the one can be used versus one, two thousand and eleven or something like that. Oh, I think. Right. Yeah, just about moderation. Moderators also didn't really, uh, there's been some problems arising out of moderation, I think, in that they've been insisting that people do different material for the two standards. So if you did one, four, five, you couldn't do the same. Task in one four six moderators were advising people to do different tasks. That to me creates a split. In, in sorry, when they well they were in some schools. Some of the Dunedin teachers got advised that they shouldn't cover the same material, the same task for the two standards, and are forced to do different tasks. You could then get a thing in during the top through the year to get it moderated. So some schools sent off their work just to basically sort of see where they were at nationally. Well, one of the things I'm very aware of is that we're going to be developing a culture about what's, you know, what's going to be accepted and what isn't. And uh, it's obviously been a very rocky sort of first year and probably the moderators might not even quite all be seeing things the same way and, and so on. But, uh, and, and realistically, it is going to take us a year, you know, in three years' time, everyone will just say, oh, no, you can't do that, or, oh, yes, you should do one of those, or whatever, and, and it will be part of our culture. But we're breaking so much new ground here with this that it, inevitably there's going to be sort of conflicting ideas about the best way to do it and that sort of thing. And, um, but uh, I think also that there's probably a certain amount of leniency as well, so that, um, because in the end, um, I know that um, NZQA were basically saying, it is holistic. We, you know, look at what the students done. Do they really show in-depth understanding? You know, um, and or do they show some level of understanding or whatever? And if, you know, if there's evidence that they've really ripped into it and they really know what they're doing, then it might not be you know ticking all the boxes from the standard. But I think initially that will probably be accepted anyway. And and what you'll end up with is you'll develop a culture where well, the, you know, that, that went down well and that didn't, and the moderators give feedback and that sort of thing. And, so people start to figure out you know, what's safe and what's not. Um, and it, it, it is difficult because, of course, a lot of you are learning on the job too, but those who have been teaching programming for a while, you, you can probably recognise pretty quickly if the student has done you know, some really nice work or if the student has you know, barely managed to get the thing going in a very messy mm. kind of way. Um, and ho hopefully, eventually, that'll be what's rewarded. So, you know, the difference between students who just get it going and those who have done a very elegant job of it. It'll take a while to develop it. Okay, um, we've got a little bit of time where we can break up the groups or do a little bit more of what we want to do. Um, and I really, I've had a few ideas about how we might do that. I can suggest some things we could do as, as we break up, but is there any sort of topics or things that someone would like to suggest that you'd like to spend a bit more time on? And then we can find out how many people, how many other people would like to do that. Best languages, I suppose. The, the oh, choosing choose best language. Yeah. We've got a session tomorrow actually at the soapbox where I've asked a few people to talk about their languages. Not, not a hard sell, but hopefully just talk it. Because the simple answer, answer there, there, you know, there is no correct answer, but yeah, it would be good to at least see a few and look at the advantages and disadvantages and something. Yeah. So more, of more of the 2.44. More of the 2.44 stuff. Uh, oh, 1.44 rule. Uh, okay, the first session tomorrow was an hour and a half on that. Yep. Yep. Uh, to answer Max's question, the last date for assessment of the superseded version of the internally assessed achievement standards categorised as the ones that we've talked about is December 2012. I'll post that link up on the right. list. Cool. So you've got a year's grace. Yeah. I would say though that actually um, the changes that have been made to like four six are a lot better because like, we basically had it was contrived to yeah. get the nest that loops running I'm mean, so much happier to just drop that out and to go with the new version. I wouldn't want to use the, the current version again. 
yeah. yeah, people were prepared to constrain by resources. What, what was nice though was that there was some clarity about what constituted American excellence, whereas mm -hmm. now it seems to be a lot more a judgment case of if they don't, you know, how are we going to justify a comprehensive, uh, effective procedural structure that constitutes a well structured logical solution of the task? as opposed to a procedural structure with well-chosen actions, conditions and control, control structures. So when I do my assessment schedule and I have to identify things that are going to put me in one or the other of those, how on earth am I going to specify that in a way that's logical and easy to moderate and clear to students? Well, the BAT bar is toasted and... No, no, I mean, I'm not... <laughs> yeah, just, uh, at least with the other one, it was, there was a, this is a, a case, this is an example of what is required for excellence, that was quite clear. Yeah. So yeah. It, it would be good to have examples. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually working on it. It's actually probably good to have negative examples too, like, you know, this is not well structured. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I imagine the kind of thing we're looking at is, you know, if you've got a program that prints the numbers from one to five, and one student goes print one, print two, print three, print four, like that down the page, then it absolutely does what was asked. But it's it's not well structured, right? That you'd use a for loop for all sorts of stuff. So you know, the idea that longer isn't better and all sorts of stuff like that, but shorter isn't necessarily better. Perhaps that's a small group that could get together. Actually, yeah. So who would be interested in that sort of thing? Um, talking about that or lobbying to get some of that sort of thing? It's very small. Oh yeah, okay. So so um, so um, what, what's that? It's it's a, a, evaluating. The new 145, 46, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. An interesting one, I'm just going to check out a clear account conference recently too, about the new one where it's the, uh, working independently and accurately. That one. Oh, independently and accurately, and yeah. There was a lovely lady on course said her marketing is very simple now. She would just go, they needed help, there's my cheese. They did it quite well, there's my merits, there's my marketing. So you don't really need to worry about that part, you're worried about it. Yeah. They're all, didn't they? Yeah. And there's no step up for excellence. If you give them merit, you've got an excellence. <laughs> for independence. Yes. Yeah. Independence and accuracy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this is really swift code and everyone is going to look at this and say, wow, that's so efficient. But sorry, the company went bankrupt because we couldn't afford, you know, for you to spend all week. Yeah. 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 But it's putting more into that technology prototyping phase that you can hook it into the generic technology ones. Because yeah. of the prototyping, that would be enforced with that. I think the other thing we have to remember here is that we're talking about beginner programmers just having a, a little yeah. dabble with, with coding. We're not talking about Microsoft engineers who will ruin the world if their code falls over or at least waste 180 lives or something. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, sorry, so, so, so there's one conversation that we could break off, and there's probably a group interested in that. Um, which is the evaluating ideas to see if anyone wants to kind of lead a group on that. Just to, to, uh, or maybe Anthony to. Yeah, I could. I, I thought much more about the level two, wasn't I? about that. Okay. So, so, so we'll do that. Um, another one that I was going to offer is just basically more on uh, 144, going through you know, other ways to, to teach the bits of that. So, if anyone's interested in doing that. So, tomorrow's about 240. Two forty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'll put that up for offer. Anyone else want to offer a topic? Or? Oh, no, I don't want to offer. Right. Okay. Well, I'm sure there's someone who's done one five up. One five up. Yeah. Anyone remind me of one five up? Infrastructure. Oh, infrastructure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to do that one next year, but I don't know why. Okay, so who would be interested in just getting a little group going to talk about 150? Uh, oh, I did it, and that's the only thing I know how to do. I'm actually feeling really uncomfortable about the whole computer science programming stuff. There's lots of talk and language here which I don't understand, and hopefully I'm not alone, because if I am, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> but infrastructure bit, I can do. Give me something I'll put my hands on, not a problem. So I can do that one, but that's... No, that's... That, yeah. You, and, and this is something I, I don't know if I acknowledged it very well at the beginning of the day. It, this should be uncomfortable because it's, it's, this is the first time in the world that these sort of topics mm. are being taught in schools. And it's certainly not being taught in colleges of education and places like that as well. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot to get your head around. Part of, part of the goal of this, though, is that although a lot of these, this technology sort of seems confusing and, that, and there is a lot of it, um, there's not that much. Um, and most of it actually, like, you know, algorithmic complexity just means how long does the program take to run and things mm. like that. So, that, um, actually, one thing I, maybe I'll check this out now. Um, some, some of you will have uh, seen this handout that I've done, which, um, in fact, in this very room, uh, when we did all the unplugged stuff, we did a lot of things with primary school kids, and we had, so I've had a lot of shows in here with five to 12 year old kids doing a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. And, uh, you know, sort of tell them, you know, you've just done an algorithm, or you've just done, you know, uh, parity, error coding, or something like that. And, and when they're 5 to 12, they just go, oh, well, that's neat, you know. Um, and uh, the, um, but one girl put her hand up, she was sitting right there, actually, and, and I remember, and she said, can I ask a question? Was, yeah, and she said, why do you use such big words for such simple ideas? And um, because a lot of this stuff is, uh, you know, it's, it's not trivial, and certainly to do the advanced stuff, you know, people do heaps and heaps of study. But a lot of it is just big words for, for quite simple ideas. Um, so anyway, inspired by her, um, I, I did do this handout which is called Big Words for Simple Ideas. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> we, we went through every big word we could find in the level 1, 2 and 3 standards and, and just wrote a, a, a very simple definition. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. As an idea to the Is there anybody who can combine the programming and the other Is there anyone who can combine it together? Yeah. 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 Uh, by the way, we are having another session like this tomorrow too, so we can probably split out
really nice up here. Do you know what's it like coming up? Yeah. 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 Digital media. So, would anyone interested in having a half hour session on digital media? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would be. What if one being more than one class? Did anybody use PHP as ever one? As a language of choice? Or. Yeah. 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 I might save the robots for tomorrow if that's, or you can, when you get there you can choose which one you do. Um, so, so, upstairs, it's not as cold up there either. Um, room 441, we've got room 445, room 446, and room 447. Yeah. Yeah. There's one or two media. Both. Yeah. This is just going to be a half hour chat. This is probably get to know other people who are concerned about this. Um, so, pick your room number, and I'll leave it up to each group to kind of, you know, elect someone in charge. Take the stairs up the middle of the atrium to the room.